Oh, thank you, Lord Jesus. We love you. We love you. We love you. We love you. We love you, God. We love you, Jesus. Amen. Praise the Lord. While you're standing, would you please turn with me to the book of Genesis, chapter 31. Genesis 31. I do want to remind again, as was stated, that August 5th there's going to be... um, orientation if you would like to be involved in the prison ministry. I think you could also see Brother Abraham. Where's Brother Abraham? You know where that's going to be? The orientation? Okay, you can see Brother Abraham and he can and uh, but this is uh, this is two institutions and so everyone that can be involved and dive into the pool and be faithful. It would be very, very, very important. Also, I'd like to say um, thank you for all the prayer and fasting that has been going forth in behalf of Peak. And then, of course, Summit as well, but we'll come back to that later in the year. But uh, come to find out, there was... uh, I, best I got it, I know two of them knew, but there was over four people, I think, unbeknownst to each other, that fasted ten days each about this and a host of things. And uh, so I believe God's going to move, and not only in this church, but of course, Peak, and a lot of prayers been going up, and thank you for that. Genesis 31, we're going to begin reading at verse number 26. Genesis 31, beginning at verse 26. And Laban said to Jacob, What hast thou done, that thou hast stolen away unawares to me and carried away my daughters as captives taken with the sword? Wherefore didst thou flee away secretly and steal away from me and didst not tell me that I may not have sent thee away with mirth and with songs, with tabray and with harp, and hast not suffered me to kiss my sons and my daughters. Thou hast now done foolishly in so doing. It is in the power of my hand to do you hurt. But the God of your father spake unto me yesternight, saying, Take thou heed that thou speak not to Jacob either good or bad. And now, though thou wouldest needs be gone, because thou sore longest after thy father's house, yet, wherefore, hast thou stolen my gods? And then on down in verse 51, And Laban said to Jacob, Behold this heap, And behold, this pillar which I have cast betwixt me and thee. This heap be witness, and this pillar be witness, that I will not pass over this heap to thee, and that thou shalt not pass over this heap and this pillar unto me for harm. The God of Abraham and the God of Nahor, the God of their father, judge betwixt us. And Jacob swear by the fear of his father, Jacob, Isaac, excuse me, the fear of his father, Isaac. Lord Jesus, touch our hearts and our minds with your word today. We commit this into your hands in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. God bless you so much. You may be seated. By way of a little bit of intro here. Bottom line, we have a man named Jacob that 20 years before fled into the land of Pendanaram, or what is today Syria. And there he takes a wife. Before it's over, he actually has four wives. One was a surprise. Be that as it may, he now has... Um, 11 sons, has one daughter, and 
His father-in-law, he has worked for him for these last 20 years. His father-in-law has changed his wages 10 times, irregardless of every effort made to shortchange Jacob. God comes on the scene and continually blesses Jacob as well as his father-in-law Laban because of him, because of Jacob. And the last bargain they made, God vastly, overwhelmingly blessed Jacob until his herds were far, far larger and his flocks were far, far larger than were the flocks of his father-in-law. His brother-in-laws, his two wives' cyst brethren, are not happy. The father's not happy. So Jacob steals away. He takes his herds, his flocks, his children, his wives, and he's making his way back to the land of Canaan. Laban realizes they are gone. He gets his boys. He runs after him. Uh, Of course, horses, etc. Overtakes them. And apparently he had a little powerful entourage with him. He let Jacob know, it's in my power to hurt you. But I'm not going to hurt you because the God of your father spoke to me last night and told me to say neither good nor bad to you. But why did you steal away, steal my daughters, steal my grandsons, not even let us give you a goodbye party, And then he says, why did you steal my gods? In the verses we did not read, Jacob tells him why he got out of there. He also told him he changed his wages ten times, etc. And then when it comes to the subject of his gods, he said, I didn't steal your gods and kill anybody in our ranks that have got them. So Laban goes his way from tent to tent to tent looking not realizing that the beautiful wife that Jacob had by the name of Rachel had stolen her father's gods and she was sitting on top of them and, and uh, they weren't very big. They were in a bundle. There she sat and he tore the tents apart looking. She said she was in the manner of women so he left her alone could not find his gods. Be that as it may, he makes a league with Jacob. And he puts a heap, a pile of stones together. It is also referred to as a, 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 a pillar. And there he says, we're going to swear that I never cross this line to go to you to harm you, and you never come back this way across this line to harm me. And then he says, amen, this heap will be a witness to us. And then he makes this statement, the God of Abraham and the God of Nahor, the God of their father, judge betwixt us. We are going to swear by these gods. And so Jacob did swear, but he swear by the fear of his father Isaac. Now, we know that Jacob's grandfather Abraham, he worshipped Jehovah God. God spoke to him, told him to leave his house, the land of Ur, and go to a place that God would show him. When centuries later, Joshua was bringing all of the inhabitants of the house of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob back, a vast multitude of two and a half to three million people. And he brings them into the promised land. He gathers in verse 24 of Joshua all the tribes of Israel together. He presents them before God. And Joshua speaks to all of the people says, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Your fathers, going back many, many generations, dwelt on the other side of the flood in old time, 
And then he says, even Terah, the father of Abraham and the father of Nahor. And so Abraham was father to Isaac, who was father to Jacob. Nahor was father to Laban. And this is what Joshua is referring to. And he says, And they served their gods. And then in verse 3, And I took your father Abraham from the other side of the flood and led him throughout all the land of Canaan and multiplied his seed and gave him Isaac. So communication is a tricky deal. And, and I'm going to be teaching on this later. But it's really, really, really tricky. Even as I'm speaking to you right now, my lungs are at work, my body's at work, and I am squeezing air out of my lungs, and it's going up through my vocal cords, and they're vibrating. My brain is working in conjunction, hopefully. And so words are going out of my mouth. There's a lot that comes into that. There's, I'm made up of a, of a unique gene pool, as we all are. I've got a lifetime uh, going on 65 years before long of experience. I've been educated my own certain ways. God's taught me. And so I have all of these cumulative thoughts, and I'm working them up out of my lungs, into my vocal cords, and out to you. Meanwhile, you're out there, and, and these, these, these sound waves are carrying my voice the microphone, amen, is helping me, but your eardrums are picking them up. And so you got little things vibrating in your ears, and they do that, and so then that starts working in your brain, and, and so you're getting these messages, and then it has to go through your gene pool, and your experiences, and your vocabulary, and so somehow I have to communicate to you, and that's the reason however many hundreds of people are here today, I'm not speaking to one, I'm speaking this many messages. Because what's happening is every single one of us, this will mean something to you that it may not mean exactly perfectly the same to your neighbor there because we're all assimilating this information. This is like driving down the highway in L.A. traffic. It's not a miracle that every now and then you see a wreck. It's a miracle there's not a wreck every second. The miracle of communication is not that some things are misunderstood. The miracle is that anything's understood because of all this stuff. But, but, but be all that as it may, our unique God did this. But have you ever been in a conversation with somebody, they're saying one thing, but they mean entirely something else than what you're picking, than what, the way you see it. And this makes for unique situations. But, but Laban meant one thing, and Jacob listening is picking up on nuances that somehow doesn't mean the same thing to Laban. And he's saying, we're going to make a, a, a league between us based on these stones. We're going to call on, on Nahor's God, Terah's God. Abraham's God. But Jacob knew that Nahor and Terah's quote-unquote version of God slash God's was different than Abraham's. You mean one thing, and you're going to swear by your father's gods, but I'm listening to you, and I'm going to swear, I'm going to make a promise here to God too. But we're not going to use the same vocabulary in this process. And so I'm going to read this to you in New Living. He said, see this pile of stones, Laban continued. See this monument I've sent between us. They stand between us as a witness to our vows, etc., etc., etc." And he says, I call on the God of our ancestors, the God of your grandfather Abraham and the God of my grandfather Nahor to serve as judge between us. But notice, so Jacob, Jacob took an oath before the fearsome God of his father Isaac to respect the boundary line. 
Amplified says, the God of Abraham and the God of Nahor and the God, uh, the object of worship of their father, Terah, an idolater, judge between us. But Jacob swore only by the one true God, the dread and fear of his father, Isaac. Because he's looking at it one way, amen, Laban's looking at it another, and he says, you swear by what you want to, but I'm swearing by the God of my father. I'm swearing by that God. And he could have actually looked at him and said, you don't even have any gods to swear by. You came into this camp because somebody stole your gods. How are you going to swear by gods? You can't even find your gods. Somebody stole them. And you're going to swear by that? But he didn't get into that. It wasn't a time for a Bible study. He just didn't have a Bible yet. But nevertheless, so you swear by what you want to swear by, but I'm going to swear in the fear of God to the God that Isaac and Abraham worshiped. I'm going to give you the title of what I want to talk about this morning. It really means something to have the right God. It really means something to have the right God. And so Laban, I'm going to tell you something. I'm the one that's got the right God here. I'm the one that God has blessed betimes in spite of you and all of your wiles. I'm the one that you, God has blessed with the flocks and the herds, and you're here, and you're jealous, and you're mad, and you can't even find your gods. So thank you. I'm going to stick with the God what brought me here. I'm going to stick with the God that has proven. As for me and my house, we've learned it pays a man to have the right God. Hallelujah. And the Bible is full of this. We could go down through history and, and take interviews and, and start interviewing the various Canaanite peoples when Abraham's people, Isaac and Jacob's descendants, were brought to the river by Moses and then were carried through by Joshua. Amen. And they began the, the conquest of the land of Canaan. Ask the Perizzites when it was all said and done, if it pays to have the right God. Ask, amen, the Moabites. Ask the Jebusites. Ask the Gibeonites. Ask the Hittites. Ask all of them if their gods were able to help them. And I'm here to tell you there was a group of people that would look around after victory, 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 victory, and look around and say, you know what? It pays to have the right God. Hallelujah. Ask the Philistines when, when somehow they had ended up procuring the Ark of the Covenant and they put it into the temple of their god Dagon. And they come back the next day to see if they got along and come to find out Dagon is laying on its face in the dirt. So they pick up their god. That's sad. He couldn't pick himself up. They pick him up and they set him back on his, his little stump there. And when they come back the next day, he's not only on his face, his hands are cut off and his feet are cut off. So if they put him back on the stump, he couldn't stand anyway. Now that's a sad God. That's a pitiful God. Right about then, somebody should have been saying, I think we got the wrong God here. Somebody should have connected the dots. Amen. It means something to have the right God. Ask a man by the name of Goliath. If it pays, in fact, in 1 Samuel 17, begin reading at verse 43. And the Philistines said unto David, So Goliath is looking down in the valley of Elah. There at the bottom is a brook. There David has taken five smooth stones. He's making his way up, and he sees that it's but a boy. He's been challenging all of the armies of Israel for 40 days and 40 nights. He sees it's a boy. And so the Philistine says to David, am I a dog? Am I a dog? That thou comest to me with staves? You come with little sticks to get me? Am I a dog? You're going to whip? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And he curses David 
by his gods. Read. And the Philistines said to David, come to me, and I will give thee thy flesh unto the fowls of the air. You come on up here, and I'm going to show you the most ignominious death. The fowls of the air are going to be picking the bones, the, the meat off your bones before this day is over. And to the beast of the field. And the beast of the field will come in the nighttime, and they'll finish up what the birds leave. Then said David to the Philistine. So David looks up to the Philistine. Thou comest to me with a sword. You come with a sword. And with a spear. And with a spear. And with a shield. And with a shield. But I come to thee I'm in not the name of the bring Lord. Up, I'm not even going to bring up your gods. Because your sword and your, your spear and your shield is more powerful than your gods. I'm not even going to talk to you about your gods. Amen. Read. But I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts. But I'm going to tell you who I'm. I don't have a sword. I don't have a shield. I don't got any of that. But I tell you, I've got the right God. I've got the right God. It means something to have the right God. If you don't, and we know the end of the story. Amen. In 1 Kings 18, Elijah is so tired of the Baal worship that's gone on. He calls Ahab's 450 prophets of Baal to come up to the top of the Mount Carmel. And he says to all of them in the sight of Israel, call on the name of your gods, and I will call on the name of the Lord. And the God that answereth by fire, let him be God. And all the people answered and said, it is well spoken. And we know the story. Before it's over, you got 450 prophets of Baal. They have made up their altars. They've put out the, the meat offerings. And, 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 they, and they're calling upon Baal. And, 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 and so, after a while, Elijah says, call louder. He can't hear you. Baal, Baal, call louder. Baal, Baal. After a while, the sun's going higher and higher. It's in the afternoon. They jump up on the altars. They're jumping around screaming. After a while, they bring out their lancets. They start cutting themselves. They're putting their blood on it. They're screaming. And he's saying, hey, maybe your God is on a journey. Get louder. Maybe he's asleep. And in the Masoretic text, he said, maybe he's in the bathroom. You better get with it. And they're looking at him. And the sun's about to set. Time out. He's put me 12 stones. Put the bullocks. Get 12 barrels of water. Douse it. This is in the middle of a drought. Douse it. Get more. 12 more barrels. Douse it again. I want 12 more barrels. Douse it again. He's dug a trench, amen, a ditch around about it. The ditches are full of water. Everything is sopped. And then he utters a 64, some say 65 word prayer. And all of a sudden, fire from heaven. It burns up the water. It burns up the the offerings. It burns up the stones. There's nothing left. And then he says, grab those false prophets and kill them all. Can I tell you, it pays. It means something to have the right God. And I don't want to be in this crazy 21st century without the right God. And this God we're talking about is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's why in 2 Kings, amen, the king of Assyria, he says to King Hezekiah, he says to all the people in Jerusalem, don't let Hezekiah deceive you. He ain't going to be deliver you out of my hand. This is Sennacherib, king of the Syrian empire. Don't let him make you trust in the Lord, saying God will deliver us. Hath any of the gods of the nations delivered at all his hand out of the hand of the king of Assyria? 
Where are the gods of Hamath and Arpad? Where are the gods of Sarveam and Hana and Iva? Amen. That delivered, did they deliver say? Who are the gods of the country? Show me a God anywhere that's delivered anybody out of my hand. Well, he was fixing to find out it pays to have the right God. Because the morning he arose his 185,000 man army, even secular historians will tell you this moment changed the course of history. And it's, it's a sound reveille. Where's that trumpeter? Goes to his tent. Get! He kicks him. What's wrong with you? His eyes are rolled up in his head. The camp is still a stone. There's not even birds chirping. He goes from one tent to the next. They never even got out of their knapsacks. His 185,000 man army, his graveyard dead. And as a footnote as to whether it pays to have the right God, when he goes home, he makes his way back to Nineveh and he goes to worship Nisroch, his God, in his temple. And while he's in there with his God, worshiping it. He's got two boys that hate him and kill him. And his closing thoughts as he left this terra firma slipping into eternity might have been, I wish I'd have had the right God. Because it didn't do him any good. If you don't believe that, ask Egypt when The children of Israel are marching out. Amen. And all of their firstborn are dead. Ask Egypt when the river Nile that they worshipped was turned into blood as a god. Ask Egypt that worshipped cattle as gods. Amen. When they're all hit with a moraine. Ask they worshiped the sun when the sun was darkened, amen, to where it was so dark that they couldn't see in their dwellings. Ask every single plague that God brought upon them directly was an affront to one of the multiple gods of Egypt, amen. Ask Egypt as they essay to go through the wide open Red Sea, amen, And the sea comes collapsing in on them. Can I tell you something? Pharaoh would be happy to tell you right now. It means something to have the right God. Hallelujah. It pays to have the right God. If you don't believe it, amen. Ask Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. In Daniel chapter 3, begin reading in verse 28. Then Nebuchadnezzar spake and said. Now here's the picture. Nebuchadnezzar has set up. A huge, solid gold idol. Huge. On the plains of Shinar. He says, when you hear the sound of the music, he names all of the instruments. Everybody in this kingdom is falling on their face to my God. And whoever does not fall on their face to my God, I have a furnace here that is heated. And you will be fried chicken for dinner. Well, he wasn't going to eat them, but he was going to burn them up. So, he looks out. Everybody's bowing. He's so happy. Hey, get up. Yes, sir. Who's those guys out there standing? Well, that's your three Hebrew boys you like so much. That's Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. Why aren't they bowing? I'd be happy to go get him. You can ask him. So read. Blessed be the God of Shadrach. Oh, okay. Hold on. So he gets him. 
He says, bow or burn. They said, we're not careful. We may burn. He may not deliver us. But we can promise you this. We ain't bowing. He said, throw them in. He heated it up seven times hotter as ever wanted to be heated. The men that were taking them to the, it was such a blast furnace. It killed a man, the men that were trying. And they, they walk on in. He looks from his vantage point. He doesn't see three men burning. He sees three men walking around. He sees another man in the midst of the fire. They come out. They don't even smell of smoke. Everybody. Now I'm just, I don't know this, but wouldn't it be something if everybody's still on their face and every now and then they peek up? Where's Meshach? They're about to be burned. Ooh. Is he really burning them? They're burning. They're going in. Woo! What's happening? Let me check. No. What? Look. That's me, Shaq. I thought you said they went in fire. They did. Now what? Nebuchadnezzar's getting on his podium. What's he going to do? Apparently he's going to proclaim something. What's he going to say? Then Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God Blessed! of Shadrach. Blessed be the God of Shadrach. Meshach and Abednego. Meshach and Abednego. Who has sent his angel. Who sent his angel. And delivered his servants that trusted in him. Delivered his servants that trusted in him. And have changed the king's word. And they changed the king's word. And yielded their bodies. They yielded their bodies. That they might not serve nor worship any god except their own god. There is no worship of any god but their god. Therefore I make a decree. Therefore I make a decree. That every people, nation, and language. Every people, nation, and language. Which speak anything amiss. Against that the God speaks anything I miss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces, and their houses shall be made a dunghill. I'll make your house a dunghill. I'll cut you in pieces. Say one word against their God. Because there is no other God that can deliver after this sort. And I, it doesn't say this, but wouldn't it be something if Meshach stood up on the podium and said, what he means is get up. There ain't no God but Jehovah. Woo. This is why. Amen. When Joshua called all those people together and he said, come on now. You saw the gods that, 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 that Nahor worshipped. Amen. That Terah worshipped. But that's not the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He said, so if you seem evil today to serve the Lord, amen, choose you this day who you're going to serve. Whether you're going to serve Terah's gods and Nahor's gods that they worshipped on the other side of the flood, amen, or are you going to worship Jehovah God? Choose you this day. Yes, or are you going to worship the gods of the Amorites in whose land we dwell? As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Because we got a revelation. Hallelujah. It means something to serve the right God. Having said that, it not only means something to serve the right God. It means something to know something about the right God we are serving. This is why Hebrews 13 and 8, Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. All of the instances of that Old Testament Jehovah God that we've talked about from the Old Testament. One day they looked at Jesus, amen, and they said, who makest thou thyself? Where is your father? He said, well, he that hath seen me hath seen the father. For the father that dwelleth in me he doeth the works. You see, before Abraham was, I am. And the name Jesus means Jehovah Savior. And so what that means is, I know nobody in here knows what I'm fixing to do next. This one Jehovah God who is invisible, who is a spirit, 
who can't bleed, who can't die, who can't be tempted and tempts no man. This one eternal invisible God, hallelujah, he came into the world and the world was made by him, John 1 tells us. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. All things were made by him when God spoke everything into existence. Without him was not anything made which was made. And the Word, that spoken logos, that expression became flesh and dwelt among us. That's why in John 1 and 10, he was in the world and the world was made by him. That's why Jesus said, he that hath seen me hath seen the Father. For the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. This is why Galatians 3, 16, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest. In, I'm here to tell you, it, it means something to have the right God. We don't have Jehovah Junior. Hallelujah. We don't have the second person of a triune God. We serve the one true only God. That God so loved the world. He gave his only begotten son. Hallelujah. He became flesh and dwelt among us. The name Jesus means Jehovah hath become salvation. And what does it mean? Does it pay to serve that God? Does it mean something to love that God? Hallelujah. To know who he is. To take on his name in baptism. I remember one time, and I, I, I'll, I'll move through this quick because I gave it just a while back, but we were in Israel. A guy was wanting to debate me. He kept bringing it up about he didn't believe that baptism should be done in Jesus' name because Jesus is the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. That's why the apostles, every time they baptized, it was in Jesus' name. Amen. Because the name of the Father is Jehovah. Amen. Became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus said, I, I have by inheritance. Hebrews tells us we have by, he has by inheritance a more excellent name than the angels. He said, I've come in my Father's name, Jehovah Savior. And so the name of the Father was Jesus, the name of the Son was Jesus, and the Holy Ghost in you is Christ, in you the hope of glory. It's Jesus everywhere. That is the name of the Father. So Father's a title, Son's a title, Holy Ghost is a title. The name is Jesus. I'm a father, I'm a son, I'm a husband. My name is Larry Booker. I'm also a uncle, I'm also a friend, I'm also a bishop, I'm also a preacher, I'm also, I've got all kinds of titles, but my name is Larry Booker. He has all kinds of titles, but his name is Jesus. It's the only name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved, Acts 4. 11. 12. What does it mean? Amen. And so this guy kept, uh, and I said, I, I found he was a denominational guy. I said, have you ever cast out devils? He said, yes. I said, how did you cast them out? I cast them out. What name did you use? Jesus name. I said, next time you face a devil, try casting it out using titles, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And see if it works. It's going to take the name of Jesus to get those devils out. Or you could be like, does it mean something to have the right God? You can be like the missionary brother Hanscom. I know one of his nephews, great young man, pastors up in New Brunswick. How that they were there, missionaries, and his oldest son got very, very, very sick. Sick nigh unto death. Doctors, nobody could help them. They were praying. They were calling on God. These are this many decades ago. They couldn't get communications out. And they were praying, God, please lay us on somebody's heart. And there was, there was a couple. They were in church. And they were baptized in Jesus' name, filled with the Holy Ghost. And, and woke up in the middle of the night. Their phone was ringing, not cell phones. There were no cell phones in those days. They picked it up. They heard a language speaking. They didn't know what it was. Later, they connected all the dots. It was the miracle how they even found out. And then, 
in broken English. Pray, pray, you must pray. Pray or the child will die. Pray, pray, you must pray or the child will die. And the line went dead. It rolled out of bed, started praying, 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 praying. Oh, God, whoever this child is, God, oh, we don't know. It was many months later. And they wrote down the night, the time of day. Meanwhile, in Pakistan, Brother Hanscom was over his book. There was an area of Pakistan, a wild tribal people, a man that had leanings of Muslim religion and conglomeration of stuff that they were they hated Christians they hated it was a dangerous place to go missionaries nobody went there and brother Hanscom he said Jesus I beg you heal my boy and in desperation he said if you heal him I'll go to such and such a place and preach later that night and when the tide turned Months later, they were in the States on deputation. They told that story. This couple, as soon as search was over, they came running. They said, was the date of that such and such a date? He said, yes. It was this time. What time is that there in Pakistan? Yes, that's when the tide turned. And told about the phone call they received and the voice. And they rolled out and prayed and travailed. So his boys was healed. He said, a few weeks went by and he was dragging his feet. And God kept tapping him on the shoulder about the promise he'd made. Finally, so he, he went to some of the Pakistani brethren. He said, who will go with me? Nobody wanted to go. Finally, I think there was two or three guys. They said, we ain't going to let you go alone. And they went. From the time they entered the area, the hostility they could feel was getting stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger finally got into the middle of the village everybody was pouring out the chieftain was at the back he stood up on a on an area and he's preaching while he's preaching and the guy's translating for him for this dialect and he's he's and they're getting madder and madder and madder and he said all of a sudden he said it felt like i was a a a, a large somehow glass of light all the way around me Settle down. He said, I lost my fear. He said, a boldness hit me. He said, I'm preaching with all my heart. He said, it's almost like I'm half mad, but I'm challenging them. I'm getting in their face. I'm screaming at them. They're getting madder and madder. And he said, bring your sick. Bring them right now. Let's see who God is. Bring him now. And he's challenging him and he stops. And somebody hobbles up, looks at him. He said, I was fearless. He said, it was pure faith pumping through me. It was a Holy Ghost work. He laid hands. They were instantly healed. And then another, and then another. Long story short, a church was started in that village, baptizing in Jesus' name, filled with the Holy Ghost. And the tribal chieftain did not get converted. But he said, the only Christians that can ever come into this village are those people right there. Can I tell you, It pays to have the right God. Can I tell you, it means something to have the right God. I could go on, but I'm running out of time. I could tell you about the time I was up and preaching for Brother King in Oregon. And old Brother Ellis Sism was in the hospital from which he would never get out. He'd been a missionary to India for years and years. So we were standing by the bedside of that old, frail missionary up in his 90s. And I said, Brother, let's all stand. I said, Brother Sism, can I ask you a question? I said, I've heard this story many years ago. And I always wanted to ask somebody that had a very intimate knowledge of India. And I'm going to tell you the story, and you tell me if you've ever heard this story. I just, I just, you know, I want to just, 
I'd like it to be verified. I want to know. I said, the story is that there was a a woman in India. It was one of the times decades ago when famine was stalking. It wasn't a widespread, but but there were people dying and the poverty. And there was a woman, she had three children. She had no husband, apparently died. She was, they were living off minuscule amounts of food, just trying to keep alive. They were growing thinner and thinner and thinner and skinnier and skinnier. And she knew if this kept up, they, were gonna, they weren't going to make it. So she went into one of the Hindu temples, of which they have 33 million gods. Some say 36. She stood in the middle of the, one of those temples. My children are dying! And I will die with them. If you feed my children, I'll serve you. And they grew even more rail thin. She went to a certain place. She was told it would work. She cried out to Allah. The Muslim God. My children are dying. And I will die with them. Feed my children and I'll live for you. And they were growing weaker and weaker. She had just enough tiny bit of meal to make the three little cakes for the kids into which she had placed a deadly poison rather than them die the hideousness of slow starvation she was going to take their lives at least with one last morsel in their mouth and then she was going to eat the poison and die holding her children and as she was about to place the morsel in her oldest child's mouth, she heard a voice say, Stop! Try me. She pulled back. Who are you? I am Jesus, the God of the Christians. And I heard Brother Ellis that she made her way and found some Christians. She received the Holy Ghost. She was baptized. She lived for God. Brother Ellis reached over and took my hand. He said, yes, it's true. I pastored her. She came to our church. God did fill her. She was baptized. And when I left India years ago, her children were grown and they were all still in church. We're in 2017. We're in the 21st century. Can I tell you it means something to have the right God? To know his name. To walk with him. Now here is an even more important statement. It means something to have the right God. Oh, it means something for that right God to have you. Does he have you? Does he have us? Hallelujah. Have, have, come on now. Have you received him into your heart? 
Have you received the baptism of the Spirit of God? Are you walking with Him? Can I tell you? Come on now. We're in the 21st century. I'm here to tell you. Wrath is not the right God. Bitterness is not the right God. Lust and immorality, covetous, jealousy, envy. None of that's the right God. Jesus is the right God. Anybody want to draw closer to that right God? Anybody want to come down and thank that right God that he spoke to your heart somewhere, someplace down the road? Is there anybody under the sound of my voice? Sir, ma'am, you've wandered around alone long enough. Come on, it means something to have the right God. He loves you, sir. He loves you, ma'am. He cares about you. Come on, come on, come on. Let God help you today. You're in the house of the right God.